Wonderful. We're going to continue our conversation today uh, uh, with really someone who's been on the forefront of protecting our markets uh, in the past and uh, continues to be a vocal voice for uh, sound, smart, uh, and efficient regulation, uh, Ms. Sheila Baer. Uh, a lot of our conversation up to this point in time has focused on technology, on infrastructure, on the questions of how do you define basic elements and components of uh, the blockchain. I think though that it's useful, particularly given your experience and uh, your, your time during the financial crisis, to maybe take one or two steps back and to talk a little bit more about laws and about financial regulation before uh, shifting into crypto assets specifically. And uh, I guess from that 10,000 square foot uh, perspective, um, I think it's good to ask you what are your views <laughs> on financial regulation? Do you feel that the rules uh, that were implemented in the wake of the financial crisis uh, have been operationalized effectively? Uh, do you find that the rules as they currently exist uh, are uh, sufficiently robust to meet the challenges, not just of crypto assets, but really uh, quickly evolving uh, right. markets? And, and, and then finally, when you look at uh, changes that have been made at times more incrementally, some a little bit more aggressively uh, uh, for financial rules and regulations, particularly as pertaining to the Dodd-Frank Act. Are you satisfied uh, really with the current state of play? Right. There's a lot in that. <laughs> that was a, there were several questions 20 there. Seconds. So <laughs> remind me if I missed some of them. So uh, look, I, I think uh, Dodd-Frank was not perfect, but I supported it. I think it, it really was a, primarily a grant of authority to regulators to strengthen rules, uh, particularly around uh, too big to fail institutions. So it was somewhat institutionally focused as opposed to product focused. So uh, it has some ramifications perhaps for, for financial innovation, but it was really more about very large systemic entities and how to make sure they didn't uh, spin out of control again. So uh, I think on that score, uh, we have a safer system. We've got more capital, we've got more stable liquidity. We've got things like the Volcker rule that set better parameters around appropriate risk taking, risk -taking for large institutions that are in the safety net. Uh, but it's still basically the system we had uh, in 2008. A little safer, but it's still basically the same system we had. So how resilient it will be, how well it will hold up uh, in the next downturn. And there will be uh, another downturn here probably in the next couple of years, most smart people are predicting. Uh, how will it hold up? Um, I hope well, you know, I, I do think that the focus now should be on strengthening regulations, especially capital. Uh, a lot of smart people like Don Cohn have called for something called a counter-cyclical capital buffer. Traditionally, regulation is pro-cyclical, so right? So when we have a crisis and a severe economic downturn and the, and the economy is starving for credit, we crack down on the banks and, and restrain credit. When things are good and, you know, the good times are rolling and we've had, you know, eight, nine years of a recovery in bank profits are record that are records the tendency is to ease up on regulation and that's that's the trend we're seeing now the idea of a counter cyclical cap capital buffer is to be counter cyclical to actually say no now in good times when banks are healthy and have healthy balance sheets and and adequate uh, earnings to retain a little bit more of that to build up additional capital buffer now is the time to do that before we get into the next downturn to make sure they are resilient and can continue to lend when a downturn or uh, most likely recession occurs. So I, I do wish that that would be the focus now. And instead, we're seeing this chipping away at uh, some of the post-crisis reforms. And while each individually may look like not a big deal, cumulatively, they're actually a, a pretty big deal. And, and I do, I do uh, very much worry about that. Well, that's, that's a particularly interesting answer when you think about crypto assets. I mean, Dodd-Frank, as, as you mentioned, really was a root of authority to regulators to think about their financial intermediaries and institutions and to think through ways to buttress uh, them in case of a downturn or as in times that are good to make sure that the provision of credit didn't outstrip really the growth, uh, GDP growth. Right. Crypto assets are an interesting target for regulators because yeah. you don't necessarily have the same kinds of uh, financial intermediaries. Yeah. So just operationalizing supervision um, creates interesting and novel questions. But before I get to those, I mean, what are your views as to crypto assets? I mean, are you a yeah. crypto skeptic? <laughs> a, uh, I mean, we've, you've, you missed uh, earlier conversations where the word 
Chern- Chernobyl came up several times. Oh my. Yes. Uh, is Yuri Rabini here? <laughs> <laughs> he was referenced. Wait, he was referenced <laughs> implicitly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but but what is your your, your view towards uh, distributed yeah. ledger technologies and more specifically to crypto assets? Yeah. No. Oh, I'm I'm very positive on fintech. I'm on the board of a, of one uh, financial technology company called Paxos, and I advise a few others. So. No, I'm very positive on it. I think there are risks and some downsides, and we need to be thoughtful about the regulatory structure that applies uh, to crypto. But distributed ledger technology in particular, I think, actually can directly address some of the issues we saw during the crisis. A lot of this, we had concentrations of risk because we have a heavily intermediated uh, financial system. And by, for instance, clearing and settlement, by going to real-time clearing and settlement, we won't have those huge concentrations of credit exposures that we saw during the crisis, for instance, in the tri-party repo market. So I, I think there's some real positives. Uh, another area that directly addressed some of the issues we saw during the crisis was tracking ownership of mortgages. <laughs> oh my gosh, as probably a lot of people in this audience know, I was a big advocate for trying to get uh, mortgages restructured to lower the payments to, uh, to make them more affordable and, and lower principal where appropriate. And uh, an impediment to doing that <clears throat> was uh, a lot of these pooling and servicing agreements that applied to securitized loans required investor consent, particularly to write down principal. You couldn't find out who owned the things. So having a distributed a DLT uh, protocol, and there's a company out in, in California now working on just this, to actually track uh, ownership of mortgages that are securitized and resecuritized to have an, an alterable you know, uh, DLT. Uh, process for recording the, the ownership of those mortgages I think has huge potential in the future for making sure we don't get into that kind of a situation again. And also will help investors too in terms of uh, wanting to invest in mortgage-backed securities, having much more transparency around the mortgages that are in those securitizations or resecuritizations. Innovation has always been uh, a hallmark of U.S. markets. Certainly prior to uh, uh, Dodd-Frank, there were calls to either loosen or rethink financial regulatory approaches in light of fostering innovation. Right. Uh, some of those right. same yes. calls were, were those tied to uh, the CDS market. Right. Uh, that, that didn't work out too well, as yeah. you of all yeah. people yeah. Uh, would know. Uh, and we still have certain kinds of uh, what some would, would call a refrain of, of such calls for uh, looser regulatory approaches uh, for financial innovation. Right. Um, when you think about distributed ledger technologies, when you think about crypto assets in particular, uh, rules are applied more heavily generally when there are fears of investor protection for investor protection or for systemic risk. Uh, do you see uh, particularly uh, uh, red red flags <laughs> right, uh, yeah. in the latter case yeah. with systemic uh, risk. Uh, are these technologies already moving into a space uh, that should cause concern for regulators? Uh, and if not, or even if so, uh, how does a regulator, how should a regulator begin to think through the, the appropriate regulatory response? Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I don't think the size of the you know, crypto assets are, are, are legitimate new asset class, but the, the size of this market is not such where I really think of it in terms of destabilizing the financial system. I do think there are very real investor protection issues. Um, a lot of people taking advantage of, especially ICOs, and, and hats off to the SEC for trying to uh, get ahead of this early and protect investors. And I know they continue to work through um, the, the applicability of the securitiz- securitization, securities laws to, uh, to ICOs, and that's an important, a very important discussion. But I do think right now uh, where I see risk flashing red, <laughs> it's with investor protection and people trying to take a hot new technology and juice it up and convince people to invest when there's really nothing to invest in. So a lot of this is just uh, fluff and if not out and out fraud, and, and retail investors need to be extremely careful. I think longer term, uh, net net, I think financial technology will contribute uh, to system stability, not the other way around. We've been talking primarily about blockchain, but I think you know artificial intelligence. So I know it's also on your list. I think that also can be very promising with some pro-consumer benefits, but also has some very significant risk uh, risk to consumer consumers in terms of how we apply AI, for instance, to to, uh, to credit decisions um, and making sure that, you know, we have a lot of laws that have been thoughtfully constructed over the years to guard against uh, 
uh, disparate impact and, and uh, credit standards that, that reinforce systemic biases. And I think it's very important that we preserve and respect that and don't dislodge it uh, with, with artificial intelligence. That said, I think AI can really expand credit availability and make it more fine-tuned to borrowers who truly can't afford that loan. And we, well, that's the, the end of the game. We want to make sure people can access loans when they can afford those loans. And we lost track of that uh, during the, the subprime uh, craze. So. Um, I, I think uh, I see most, uh, it's more uh, investor protection and maybe some consumer protection issues in AI. AI privacy too, I think, as blockchain technology develops. I guess it's called DLT. We're trying to get away from blockchain now, but as, a, as, a, as blockchain technology develops, I think there's some privacy issues as well. Some of the more process, promising applications from a regulatory standpoint of DLT uh, focus around uh, know your customer rules and customer due diligence and allowing banks to share information directly in a highly secure blockchain because now they have a very inefficient process, inefficient for them and hard for bank customers too because each time you know you have to keep doing the same due diligence on the same customer over and over again. So the ability to share information could be helpful to both uh, bank customers as well as uh, save money for banks. On the other hand, you have multiple eyes you know, with a window into this ledger where a lot of personal information is, is held. So I, I just think we need to be uh, careful and thoughtful moving forward, but allow the innovations to move forward. It's, I think the promises far outweigh the, the potential negatives. Well, from the standpoint of a bank regulator in particular, how should bank regulators look at FinTech to the extent to which some of the newest, uh, arguably uh, more promising financial innovations potentially disintermediate right. some traditional bank services, right. or alternatively, uh, put banks in a situation where they are forced to adapt by uh, mm -hmm. I integrating uh, some of that technology into their own operating systems and financial services, uh, technologies that themselves yeah, yeah. have not been entirely uh, uh, backproof, backdated, tested, and the like. Right. Uh, what should a bank regulator yeah. be thinking? Is this is this a, well, an opportunity or, or risk? I, I think it's I think it's very challenging because on the one hand uh, they don't want to stop positive innovations even if it will disrupt the current system, right? So you don't want to do that. And I mean, if technology could end too big to fail, that would be kind of a, a good thing. So you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to get in, into the way of positive innovations. On the other hand, you don't want to create a regulatory gate opening that basically, though they say it's an innovation, it's basically a regulatory arbitrage. Uh, that doesn't make any sense uh, either. And so uh, I think it's a very, very difficult uh, task ahead of regulators as they still grapple with a lot of the kind of the traditional issues that, that bank regulators always grapple with. And uh, I know uh, they are probably getting a lot of pressure from entities that could be disintermediated to you know raising red flags, be cautious, be careful, and so they need to listen to that. But they also need to take some of it with a little grain of salt because a lot of uh, the you know current players are are probably arguing their self-interest. On the other hand, they don't want to disrupt regulation, so disrupt the sector if it's done in a positive way, but don't disrupt a regulatory system that's been constructed to protect. Um, to hopefully give the public a resilient financial system to protect uh, customers from abusive financial products and services and, and to keep and make sure that banking is operated in a safe and sound manner. Those are kind of the core objectives they must never lose track of. Well, uh, just my, my own plug, I, I'd written a paper, co-authored a paper called The FinTech Trilemma. We've already talked about a series of trilemmas today, but uh, there's a challenge on the one hand of protecting uh, or achieving market integrity on the one hand, achieving financial uh, innovation on the other, and also rules clarity. That right, in effect, right. you can only achieve, uh, achieve two of those three. Um, uh, you can get a, a lot of innovation uh, with <laughs> through very clear rules of just not having them, but you may have risk to market integrity, and you can have market integrity and financial innovation, but you usually end up with a very highly complicated set of, right. of, of, of rules. One of the regulatory responses that you see across the world to this particular trilemma is the, this idea of a regulatory sandbox right. um, and that the administrative state itself is seeking to innovate in a way to keep track of uh, uh, innovations in our financial marketplace. Do you have a view of yeah. regulatory sandboxes? I'll just start there. Yeah. No, I, I, I think it's a, a very sound concept and one that has been used to in other jurisdictions, I guess Arizona's just, just launched one, and, right. and I think we should think about making greater use of it here in the U.S. I, I think the people, I'm not sure why we wouldn't want to do that. I think, you know, the people who fear it, 
are afraid that a regulatory sandbox will just again be a ruse for regulatory arbitrage and creating special rules for financial technology companies where the legacy, you know, the current existing uh, financial service providers are still stuck with the same regulatory system. So I think a lot of, if that's the concern, and I think that is the concern, that can be addressed just by how you structure the sandbox. But if you don't do a sandbox, uh, you're either going to have to go ahead and give the green light to something you're not sure about and could have unintended consequences, or just say no, in which case you could stop a positive innovation, or it creates completely, out, it, you know, it, it uh, flourishes completely outside of the regulatory system. That's not optimal either. So creating these sandboxes, carefully constructed, uh, a, a close interaction between the regulators and the innovators, this will help the regulators learn and better understand before they give a, a broader go-ahead to a particular innovation. And I don't think it needs to be limited to so-called fintechs. Let the legacy players come in too. If they've got a better idea, let them come in and play in the sandbox as well. And the sandbox might also uh, help regulators rethink current aspects of our current system. Maybe some of those rules are too complex for everybody, not just fintechs. And maybe by allowing some, uh, some flexibility and latitude for technology innovations that they will be able to get a little smarter and simpler about how they generally regulate. So I know I think it's a great idea. Well, you know, the, the OCC's FinTech Charter was launched right here uh, uh, with uh, one of your uh, former colleagues, uh, James Curry, and right. it was really to a lot of fanfare. One of the more interesting aspects of that particular event, just like this one, is that we had regulators from all across the regulatory uh, spectrum. And since then, uh, not just from the state level and the, right. and, the, and the national level, but just across the federal government itself, there's been a, a number of conversations and questions about how those federal regulators should be cooperating, not just for the OCC's FinTech Charter, but if one was to right. really get right. a, a, reg, uh, a regulatory sandbox up and going, what degree of, of coordination would be required in order to effectively operationalize administrative innovation? Yeah. You were there in, in, a, in a really tough time. <laughs> uh, and and uh, we saw even in times of crisis right. that coordination across the federal government right. can sometimes yeah. be challenging. It is, that's and for sure. I, I don't know if it's counter-cyclical, uh, but in theory it should be, that the higher the crisis, well, or even pro-cyclical, I guess, like the higher the crisis, you, sh you should have more coordination. But even there, there were challenges. Right now things are relatively stable creating perhaps disincentives for full uh, sort of federal uh, coordination and cooperation. Do you have any thoughts uh, as to either um, uh, agencies that, uh, or agency approaches that can help to effectuate um, coordination across uh, yeah. the financial uh, regulatory ecosystem? Um, are there any examples that you see in other countries that have been uh, particularly interesting to you? Uh, what are your thoughts? So I, I think the, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, at least at the federal level, is a good vehicle for to facilitate a lot of this coordination. Uh, I had actually I had pushed for FSOC uh, when I was chair of the FDIC, and, and Congress was writing Dodd Frank. Uh, I wanted to have even more authority. I was hoping that it could have some rule writing authority for rules that acry, apply across the system, and, and what we're talking about uh, now uh, definitely fulfills that. But I do think, and, and FSOC to their credit, uh, Craig Phillips will be talking to you later this afternoon. Craig and I don't agree with everything, like things like bank capital, but a hats off to him on, uh, on I think Treasury's really built uh, some great expertise on financial technology, and they've issued some, some excellent reports, and I've been a very proactive in coordinating this. Um, you know, the SEC and CFTC, too, the leadership of those two agencies have also been, uh, done a great job of publicly uh, coordinating and communicating and, and trying to define and, and provide clarity what's a commodity, what's a security, when they're going to step in, when they're not. Uh, and that's been done in a very uh, coordinated uh, fashion. So I, I think ad hoc uh, this is being dealt with, but it is, it is a problem with our siloed regulatory structure. I've long argued for we need, I don't support a single regulator, but I do think we need more regulatory consolidation and streamlining, uh, and it, it is an impediment. And then when you layer all the, the 50 state jurisdictions as well, and right now, for instance, uh, Bitcoin exchanges for the most part, or cryptocurrency exchanges for the most part are being if they're regulated or, or under many transmitter laws, it just, it just doesn't work. The New York Department of Financial Services, to its credit, 
uh, has allowed its trust charter to be used, and uh, the, the Paxos, the board that I am on, operates as a, as, a, uh, as a trust. There are a couple other companies that do, and I think they've been very pioneering and forward-looking among state regulators to craft something that will work. But uh, it's, it, at some point, it's going to need a national uh, structure. And uh, who knows, especially with the split Congress, I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> we have a, you know, a friend of mine was joking the other day, well, maybe it's not you so bad. You also have some hedge funds here who are make bets based <laughs> off of the, 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 your, your insider well, knowledge. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I doubt that. No, don't listen to me in congressional <laughs> races. So I think the smart money seems to be a Democrat House and a Republican Senate. I would put my money there. But I think, you know, if they can find middle ground, fine, that's great. They'll do things. And if they can't find middle ground, maybe it's okay that they're not doing anything. But probably, the, you know, oh, no. the, the risk may be the latter. And so uh, regulators will need to explore their current authorities to try to facilitate a lot of this coordination that, that, is, that is needed. And uh, so, but hopefully uh, Congress can step in too, because I think eventually you will need some type of a statutory authorization for a regulatory structure that, that fits this new asset class. Well, the, the, our first two days here are, are being co-sponsored uh, with the International Monetary Fund, and I had the pleasure of attending um, an event uh, there uh, maybe a week or two ago with uh, Randy Quarles, and I asked a, a particular question as to cross-border financial regulatory coordination. And the question that I asked him, I think I'd like to ask you as, as well, which is uh, FinTech is, because it's built on top of well, the internet and digital platforms and inherently cross-border right. um, space or activity. And to the extent to which you, you start to create a regulatory sandbox, regulatory sandboxes can be a source of data for, for regulators mm -hmm. so that they can uh, properly administer their own uh, securities laws in, uh, or, or banking laws in light of their domestic mandates. But sharing that information across borders can be very difficult, either because of the relationship that regulators may have with their own domestic regulated entities, or just because of uh, the relationship or posture that regulatory agencies may have to one another across borders, uh, right. to the extent that they view one another as competitors, uh, or if they're looking to to achieve greater market share. One of the things I've been struck by in FinTech is the degree to which financial market regulators are on the one hand uh, talking about prudential uh, safety and soundness uh, questions, investor protection, but they're also doing things with a light to competitive advantage and building up their own uh, domestic capital markets. Can information be shared yeah. Yeah. when you get those competitive juices uh, flowing. Uh, are these the kinds of uh, I issues that you have seen or you have heard about uh, as people get their regulatory sandboxes up and going? Uh, what kind of MOU or, 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 mm -hmm. or coordination mechanisms would be optimal so that we can generate sufficient data for yeah. best practices yeah. at the international level? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not <laughs> I'm not optimistic there. I mean, I think even domestically, there's not as much information uh, sharing there. Uh, so we just, great. you know, I wrote a, a, an op-ed and a, a comment letter on the, the proposed Volcker rule changes. And there's certainly a case to be made for, for simplifying uh, the Volcker rule. But one of the points I made with my co-author was just that there's a lot of trading data that's, that's collected under the Volcker rule. And each of the regulators, there are five different regulators involved, they each have their own form and they That's don't right. share it. And yeah. it's like, you know, there's a wealth of data here that if we, you know, if we made it consistent and consolidated it, um, I, I think it would be an amazing uh, supervisory tool. So it, it is, again, it goes back to these different regulatory silos. And the problem is 10 times worse when it comes to international information sharing. Uh, but again, using blockchain technology, especially for international payments, uh, if to the extent you're getting rid of all these individually regulated intermediate silos and each in each you know path along the chain of international um, the international payment system, uh, that will at least create a more transparent mechanism that that might be a forcing mechanism uh, to you know that all regulators can access and and get the same information. That would be huge. but um, it is a problem, and it's not unique to financial services. It's just the nature of government agencies that um, the, 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 the tendency seems to be to, to, to just, you know, silo and, and withhold as opposed to share even with other government partners. So I, I was struck, you know, getting back to your original uh, comments on capital uh, and, and sort of tying that with, with this conversation on data and, and, and standardization and the like. I was struck by, by, by your initial observation that you know, uh, we're in times of plenty, so why not ask uh, some of our, our banks to make sure that their balance sheets are as 
buttressed and, 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 and as robust as, as possible. Uh, where a lot of these banks do feel themselves threatened by the prospect of disintermediation and where they are themselves then beginning to shift and adapt by uh, uh, entering into new, not just financial markets, but again, new operating systems that generate new operational and market risks. Uh, there are different ways to, 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 to think about that risk. Right. You, know, um, you could think about that risk through new kinds of capital requirements. I'm not entirely certain as to whether or not that's, it, it fits the, the kind of problem that, that yeah. capital uh, requirements have traditionally um, tried to, to, to speak to. But uh, from a best practices standpoint, from your position on your and, board, yeah. what should banks be thinking about right. when they are looking at this menu of new technologies right. from a, a reg tech perspective, but mm -hmm. also from a fintech consumer client perspective. Yeah. What, what kinds of things uh, do you believe banks should be thinking about uh, given your former regulatory roles? Right. So um, I, I think, uh, and I think a lot of them are, uh, thinking about how uh, this technology can help them be more efficient and serve their customers better. Uh, you know, if they're worried about capital, well, if you've got a three-day settlement period, you've got to hold capital against that, you know, that exposure until your trade's settled. So that's just one easy example right there. Uh, plus, I think there's been a lot of research showing that uh, by reducing errors in their back office functions, they'll, they'll you know, just the, the manual process of having to correct something when, you know, the two different parties to the trade put in a different address or QCIP or whatever. So um, the, uh, uh, there are some t potential benefits to them, and I, I hope they're embracing the technology as something that could actually help them as well. And so, yeah, so maybe they're not intermediating that you know, that, that, uh, that transaction for three days. So they don't get to float on that or the fee or whatever, but, but they're gonna have less risk and less capital uh, applying to that as well. So if it's gonna happen anyway, let it happen and, uh, and make sure that you're, you're fully realizing the benefits. And I think a lot of them are looking at it that way. There are, though, with any new technology, there's gonna be operational risk. We have capital charges that are specific to operational risk. I know the, the regulators are constantly looking at that. It's more in the cybersecurity. Right. Um, space, then I think some some of this technology, so nation, you know, the operationalizing it in a, in a big way is, is going to be several years off. Cybersecurity on the other hand is, is very very much here and, and very real. But but there again, it's it's hard to know a major cyber event. Probably no no amount of capital. And I love capital, as everybody knows, but no amount of capital is going to protect you. So. Um, uh, but there again, I do think, you know, I criticize banks in some ways, but I want to say good things about them when I think they're doing a good job. And I do think on, on cyber risk, our, our large financial institutions lead the pack, both domestically and globally in terms of uh, the controls and, and protections that they have put in place. Well, I'm going to uh, have some questions for the audience in, in just a second, but I, I couldn't help but also uh, notice your remarks on artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Uh, and, and I want to tie that to uh, a session that we're going to have on Wednesday on uh, financial inclusion and alternative data, um, where we'll have literally people, the people on stage who build models for Equifax and, and, and Cabbage and the, and the like. What is your view towards alternative data? Do, do, are you seeing tangible signs that alternative data is allowing for an expansion of, of, of the provision of credit to uh, folks who have not traditionally had access to right. credit. Yeah. Uh, is, is this, in your opinion, uh, also a, a bit overhyped, uh, or is it really a space where you're seeing um, the potential for tangible results to, to, to really democratize access to capital and uh, other financial services for the yeah. uh, unbanked, underbanked, and the like? So, so I, I think, uh, so uh, Lending Club, I think, gave the, was, I believe it was the Philadelphia Fed, gave a couple years worth of, of, uh, of data, which they, uh, their researchers analyzed and found that it was expanding access to credit, uh, that those who, under traditional criteria, would have qualified for subprime credit were getting prime credit, so were getting lower price credit. It was also showing that it was marketplace lending, this isn't really an AI issue, just a more technology, that in rural areas where there have been branch closings, that this was continuing uh, credit flows through, through marketplace lending. So I do think there's some <clears throat> evidence along those lines already. 
that said, uh, I, I think we need to be careful about it. Look, you don't want AI to be used as an excuse, right? Oh, the algorithm made me do it. And we've, we've heard that a little bit, you know, some Google and Facebook, some of the silly things that were going on there. Oh, it was our algorithm. It's like they weren't responsible for that. So you're always responsible for your own AI. And I think regulators always don't ever buy into that, that the humans who design these are responsible for them. And if they can't explain the result that, it, that that's being produced, well, too bad. That, that, that's not an excuse. And, uh, you know, computers can understand correlation, but they cannot understand causation. They cannot be intuitive. They do not have morals. <laughs> there are a lot of things that hopefully go into business decisions that are significantly beyond uh, what a computer can tell you. You know, I, I tell this joke, um, I, uh, you know, to, just to exemplify the limits of AI, I used this uh, diet app. I started using this diet app, and uh, you would have to put in uh, what you ate, right, every every meal, and it had the little calories and the fat and the carbohydrates and the proteins and all that. So I did this for a couple of months, and then it was going to make. Then the idea was it was going to make suggestions to me on on how to lose weight, and so it started telling me to eat sour cream. I, well, that's a curious uh, diet <laughs> diet approach Soul. to eat a lot more sour cream. <laughs> And then I, I realized that I travel a lot. Those of you who travel know it's very hard to watch what you eat when you're traveling. You're eating out a lot. So when I'm home, I generally just have a baked potato and some steamed vegetables for dinner to kind of counteract the travel. Well, I put a little sour cream on my potato. Lo and behold, the computer is figuring out, well, she has low-calorie days, she eats sour creams. There must be cause and effect. Come on. So anyway, <laughs> it's just, been, it, it just it, you know, it, you can correlate, you know, it depends on what kind of data you're putting in, you can correlate just about anything. So you always need human judgment and intervention and the use of these new technologies. Yes, they're exciting. Yes, they can expand credit. Yes, there's some evidence of that happening, but we still need human judgment as an overlay on top of it. Great. Well, if there are any questions, uh, there are two uh, microphones here uh, to the side. Uh, and I will continue with just my, my initial response I didn't know if someone's getting up. Hey, you had mentioned the fact that well, algorithms will made me do it. You know, we had we had the the, the challenge of the first uh, couple of panels was just defining what decentralization means for crypto assets, and fintech invariably ends up either disintermediating or I don't even know. We I guess we'd have to invent a new word saying non-intermediating certain kinds of <laughs> right. financial services, right? Where you don't have a financial institution that is necessarily involved in providing services, either because of a peer-to-peer -peer network or uh, because everyone's operating off of a platform that either self-corrects or self-learns over time, but it's an initial piece of software that's helping to direct uh, and act as a conduit for uh, financial services and financial services uh, transactions. It seems to me, especially after our first two panels, that that is one heck of a challenge for regulators. And a challenge not only in deciding whether or not a financial activity falls within your remit, but even assuming right. that it does, the question is, well, how do you go about actually doing the oversight and right. regulation when you don't have a financial institution that is there? Is, is that, and, and, and you brought up this great question of the algorithms, because enforcement folks are, are trying to figure out particularly on the securities and on the derivatives end of things, you know, well, who's responsible? <laughs> is it the person who creates the software? Is it the user of the software? Does it depend on the degree of foreseeability uh, when someone creates the software and its, and, it, and its likely impact on financial markets? How do you, how do you go about um, effectively demarcating the regulatory perimeter? And even if you can do that in a way that is predictable, how do you operationalize your supervision and, 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 and the like? Uh, I won't expect you to solve that question yeah, immediately. <laughs> it's like, so can you tell us how to do that? But, but you know, you, you just have such an interesting perspective, both working in fintech now and having right. obviously been a, a you know a, a, a leading regulator for financial institutions. Are there any um, uh, ways to at least prepare regulatory agencies for right. this inevitable yeah. uh, sort of? tug and pull yeah. that innovation is, is, is currently engaged in, in, in exerting? Well, I, I think it may be a healthy process to the extent it will, it will require regulators to really get down to first principles. Why are we regulating? What are we trying to prevent? Who are we trying to protect? What is the core public policy behind this regulatory uh, uh, structure that we have uh, that is not quite fitting uh, when it comes to some of this new technology. 
but find, if, you, if you can't find a core principle, then there's probably something <laughs> wrong with the regulation to begin with. But I think for most regulations, you can find um, the, the core principle behind it and, and then uh, see if you can adapt a new regulatory approach that will still meet that objective. So, um, you know, again, getting back to uh, credit standards for consumer lending, we want to make sure consumers have loans that they can repay. I mean, that's pretty basic, but at the end of the day, that's what you want. And whatever, whether it's a marketplace lender or an insured bank or whoever, you don't want to compromise that principle. We compromised that in 2008, and we had fairly devastating results. So I think, first and foremost, what are your core beliefs? Why are you regulating? What are you trying to accomplish? And then can you adapt a regulatory system that will protect that, but still fit this new technology? The other uh, thing I would say is, if it comes to a question of accountability, default to accountability. Make everybody accountable. Uh, you know, everybody in that chain. I think the more, you know, if you want people to be thoughtful <laughs> about the code they write or the product they design or how they deliver it or uh, who they partner with or how they write their smart contracts or whatever, you want to be thoughtful and careful, make sure they understand they're accountable. If they're not accountable, they're going to go out there and take risks they shouldn't take. And there again, accountability, back to the 2008 crisis where we started this conversation, the lack of accountability was a huge part of the problem with the, with the securitization process we, uh, we had in place that was funding these, uh, these mortgage-backed securities. So I think uh, it, it, those are the two things. Stick to your core principles and make sure people are accountable for what they do. I guess the last question is more of a political economy question, but it's one that arises from my own observations uh, in securities law land, um, and, and perhaps not as much in, in banking law land. But uh, when you go to the Hill uh, and, and, and you testify or, or, or you listen to testimony, there's inev inevitably the question of whether or not a congressional response is necessary somewhere in the financial services ecosystem, uh, whether or not it be for uh, crypto assets insofar as perhaps one needs to uh, rethink or reform the 33 Act or the 34 4 Act, whether or not there need to be uh, legislative tweaks made for uh, Dodd-Frank. Uh, do you find, uh, number one, that our current set of rules as currently existing uh, are sufficiently flexible and clear that from them a sufficiently robust regulatory response right. is possible, or uh, are we quickly heading into a world where some kind of congressional uh, rulemaking and lawmaking will be necessary right. uh, in order to even optimize the effectiveness uh, and the safety of financial technology? So, yeah, I, I, I don't think we need it immediately, but yes, I think uh, congressional intervention, we do need a new statutory framework for crypto assets. They just, they just don't fit neatly in any of the categories uh, we have now. So ultimately, I think Congress will need to step up. But now the regulators have a lot of authority. The SEC and CFTC, back to the, to the, uh, the sandbox, they have their, their authorizing statutes give them fairly wide discretion to create exemptions. We're in the public interest. And so I, I do think um, they have some latitude and they've already shown leadership to try to learn about these new technologies see how they can adapt the current rules and systems uh, to those new technologies, and that ultimately will inform congressional action. So it may not be a bad thing over the next couple of years. We, we, we might not have any, any congressional action. It may and need a little longer to, to percolate. Well, well, and I don't want to get you in, in trouble with all of your, your banking colleagues, because <laughs> the, the, that answer did specifically identify the SEC and the CFTC. I did, from the, yes, I, I, I noticed did. that. Yeah. You know, but from a, a banking perspective, are there yeah. uh, any... Uh, so there, again, because banking, is unlike... So securities and, and, uh, and derivatives uh, regulation is, is more product-specific, whereas banking regulation is more institution-specific. So I, I think it's, it's more indirectly challenging to the bank regulators. Actually, I think the bank regulators uh, have, their current tools are easier because they have institutions that they regulate and they can uh, supervise those institutions and see what they're doing in terms of new technologies and have supervisory tools to deal with it. Um, so I, I do think that the, pr the challenge is more on the, on the product side than the institutional side. Over time, that might change. But, but I do think it's, it's a bigger challenge right now for the SEC and CFTC. That is very interesting and very appreciated. Thank you so very much. Let's thank Happy our speaker. <laughs>
we will then take a quick break and uh, go directly into our next round. I'm sorry.